Welcome again to our program that we have titled Revelation of the Coming King. I'm Ranko Stefanovic, professor at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University, and I'm so excited to be with you here. The question is why. I hope that you who are here and our viewers, they have our textbook for studying the book of Revelation. As you know, that each presentation that we have here is a part of the series in which we cover, we try to cover the entire book of Revelation. It's impossible to cover everything, but at least to get a glimpse into those different visions of which the book of Revelation is composed and made. So I would like to encourage you to have this textbook with you. I'm in love with this book because I know through this book God changed my life, and the book of Revelation had a special, special role in my conversion. When I discovered, when I found Jesus Christ through that book, you understood it already that it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Actually, I fell in love in him, and he's the first and last in my life. As you know that all our lectures are not the complete coverage of the book of Revelation. So we would like to encourage you to study the book of Revelation once this presentation is over for yourself. And if you have already provided for yourself the copy of this commentary titled The Revelation of Jesus Christ, I would like to tell you that the pages in this commentary that we will be dealing together with are from page 313, page 313, until, sorry, until the page 323, and then we will skip se uh, several pages, then we will move to page 365 to page 370, page 317, okay. As every time we have done it, I would like to invite you once again that we ask the one who is the greatest expert in the book of Revelation. He knows everything about that book. And he can help us, human beings, just to have a glimpse into the content of this book and to understand how this book is the true revelation of the coming King. Our Heavenly Father, we want to give you once again our deep gratitude and thanks for giving us this revelation of Jesus Christ that is the true gospel in which Jesus Christ wants to speak to us who live in these last days prior to the second coming of our King. Please be with us and give us your Holy Spirit as you are trying to understand this difficult section of the book of Revelation. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that so far you could see that we are dealing with the most difficult section of the book of Revelation. And I know so many times people are taking one text of the book of Revelation and they are using rhetorics. This is very difficult text. But if you take any serious commentary on the book of Revelation, you will see that everybody agrees. The chapters 8 to 11 of the book of Revelation is probably the most difficult section of the book. It's not easy to read it. It's not easy to lecture on this, on this section. And it's not easy really to understand all those symbols that are found there. But praise God, through Holy Spirit, we have given enough insight into this section. And I believe that the Holy Spirit can speak to us through this section of, the, of, of this book, like, like through any other section of the book of Revelation. So we are in the section of seven trumpets. Let me one more time remind you that what we saw in the very beginning in chapter 8, where this section begins, that actually the seven trumpets are the divine judgments sent to the inhabitants of this world as the answer to the prayers of God's people. So one more time, let's, let's, let's put it in different way is that actually those seven trumpets, 
as we, as we call them. They are a series of God's intervention in history in answer to the prayers of his, of his people. And let us be reminded once again that the seven trumpets, they cover the same period of history as the seven seals. They both begin with the first century, and both series, they conclude with the second coming of Christ. Not necessarily that seven trumpets and the seven seals, they cover, okay, uh, uh, each period at the same time, but they cover the same historical period between the two, coming, the two comings of, of, of Christ. Let's be reminded one, one more time that actually how the trumpets are organized. They go in pairs, in two. We saw that the first two trumpets are the divine judgments on the crucifiers of Christ and those who were involved in the persecution of the early church, the first and the second trumpet. Then after that, we are going to the third and the fourth trumpets. The deal, they actually herald God's judgments on the Christian church and the secular world of the Middle Ages and the post-Reformation period. Now this brings us to the fifth and the sixth trumpet, and we saw that the fifth trumpet actually deals with the secular world, the Western world, after the age of enlightenment. They started with the French Revolution there, there, there in, in Europe. We saw that when people rejected the Bible and replaced the Bible with the reason, use human intellect as the normative for what is the truth and what is, what, is, what is not. Actually gave an opportunity for unleashing of the demonic forces. People who really replaced religion with a human intellect and a human, human reason, they replaced God with a humanity and what human beings can, can offer. Actually they experience the consequences of their decision. But I hope that you still keep in mind what we saw that actually those demonic forces, they could not harm those who have the seal of God. Those who belong to God, those who are on God's side, they are protected from the harming and working influences of those, of those demonic, demonic forces. Even though they are judgments, but we saw that those judgments are mixed with mercy. It is during the time God is still trying to reach the human beings, to touch their hearts, and to tell, the, tell them, wake up and come back to me because the mercy is still available to the human beings. I'd like you to, que to keep this in mind because the sixth trumpet, keep in mind, the trumpets are running into pairs. The, the, the sixth trumpet actually builds on the fifth trumpet. So I'd like you now to turn to, to your Bibles and to chapter nine of the book of Revelation. Chapter nine of the book of Revelation. And this time we are going to verse 13. One, three, verse 13. We'll read the first two verses. Then the sixth angel sounded and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. We already spoke about this last time. But let us just be, be reminded. So when the sixth angel, okay, blows his trumpet, John hears a voice coming from the golden altar of incense. Usually the students of the book of Revelation, they overlook these small details. And I'd like to ask you, what is the significance of this? That the voice is coming from the golden altar of incense. I'd like to bring you back 
to the beginning of the seven trumpets. Do you remember in chapter 8? When that angel who was standing there at the altar took the prayers of God's people there from that altar of sacrifices, you remember? And he offered there before God that suddenly the judgments in terms of the seven trumpets are poured out on the inhabitants of, the, of this earth. So this is very, very important, actually telling us that the fact that the sixth trumpet is initiated from the altar of incense shows that the prayers of God's people are still remembered and that the door of salvation is still offered. Keep in mind that intercession is still going on there in the heavenly places. But we come here to another significant, significant detail. The voice the coming from the golden altar announces and says, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. The significant term here is the Euphrates River. And I know that usually the Bible students are debating about this and people are going from a literalism to the fancy interpretation of this. But I'd like to suggest to you something is what the Old Testament indicate to us. If you go to the book of Genesis chapter 15, for instance, and, 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 and the chapters that, that follow, um, you can recall that God made a covenant with Abraham. And God promised to Abraham telling him, to your descendants, I will give this land. And now there is something very interesting is that actually God specified the territory, how the territory will stretch. And God says, I will give to your descendants the territory that goes all up to the great sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea here, and says all up to the river Euphrates. You see, what comes between this great sea and the river Euphrates is the territory where God's people live. Who is beyond the river Euphrates? The enemies of God's people. Those who do not, those who do not belong, belong to God. I would like to invite the viewers, uh, if you later have some time to open the book of Isaiah, chapter 720 in Jeremiah 46, 10, you will see how the river Euphrates is always mentioned at the boundary, dividing line between God's people and their enemies. But I'd like you that we turn our Bibles to the book of Isaiah, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, verses 7 to 8. You will see whenever, whenever on God's people disaster and the divine judgments are coming on, they're coming from about the river Euphrates, okay? And so many times those enemy nations that are coming from the uh, uh, river Euphrates, they are described as the overflowing waters of the Euphrates, um, um, sweeping Palestine and destroying God's people. Please, Isaiah chapter eight, chapter eight, we will read verses seven, seven to, to, to eight. Just one, one verse. Uh, one biblical text. It says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of Euphrates. Even the king of Assyria, who is coming from Mesopotamia, because this territory was called Mesopotamia between Euphrates and Tigris. Mesopotamia means territory between the two rivers, Meso between and Potamos means river, territory between, between the two rivers. Okay, and it says, I will bring the king of Assyria and it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. I will reach even to the neck and the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land of Emmanuel. You can see here on, on typical biblical text from the Old Testament, they're telling us really what it means when the river Euphrates, okay, overfloods uh, pa pa Palestine. Okay, so 
This is what we, what we have here is. Now, as we go, keep on reading in the book of Revelation, verse 15. Where it says, and the four angels who have been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of the mankind. Boy, if this is a surprise to you, what can you say about verse 16? And the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. And I heard the numbers. Let's go quickly here through a through few, few details. The four angels, according to the text, were prepared to release demonic powers for an hour, a day, months, and a year. Okay, would you, would you be with me? If I tell you, I wanted to accomplish the task, and that task was set for a minute, for an hour, for a day, for a month. What is that that I try, try to communicate to you? That when a point time, okay? When a pointed point of time was set for the accomplish, accomplishment of this, of this task. So we're dealing here about a huge army of the demonic forces. Keep in mind that the sixth trumpet is built on the fifth one. And the task of these demonic forces was to kill one third of the humanity as we will see. By the way, if we go to verse 18, we will come to this text. We see there clearly that it, it was not actually the angels who are doing this killing, but the demonic forces. But the demonic forces evidently, okay, are not allowed to begin the harmful work until the time that was appointed to them by, by, by God. At the sound of the sixth trumpet, the restraining angels are ordered to unleash the demonic hordes to kill one third of the humanity. Now, there are a few here, there are a few details here that really we should look very, very carefully. Yes. Okay, John sees a huge army, 200 million. Okay, soldiers, troops, they appear on the scene. And he uses here an expression in verse 16, and I heard the number. Are you familiar with this expression? And I heard the number. Have you met already this phrase before? It's in chapter 7, where we have 144,000. It is only in chapter 7, in chapter 9, verse 16, in the entire book of Revelation, that this phrase is used here. But there is some, something, something more. So, so the conclusion is that this huge army, 200 million, stands in contrast to 144,000, those who are sealed, who belong to God, those who are the large generation of God's people living before the second coming, the second coming of Christ. The demonic locust that are inflicting human beings in the fifth trumpet, and they were not allowed to kill anybody. Now you can see here that the situation completely changes. Now they are really killing. They do killing. Something that did not happen in the scene of the fifth trumpet. Okay, now they both kill and inflict those who are, who are alive. Before we draw similar, uh, a line of similarities between chapter 9 and chapter 7. We would like to see, just in a few moments, the way how John describes these demonic forces. You will notice here, as you will hear through the text from, from verse 17, that actually John has a hard, a hard time to describe these forces. The language is lacking, okay? He has a trouble to, to describe them. And, and please, I'm, I'm going here through my notes instead to the text just to summarize it here. It says that the riders on the horses have a fiery red, smoky blue, and yellow burst plates, the reflections of the fire, smoke, and sulfur, 
emanating from the horse's mouth. This is, this is very unusual picture. Because the appearance of these horses is very terrifying. The purpose of this vision is to communicate to the readers of the book of Revelation something very, very significant. The heads of these, of these, of the, of the horses of this army is like of lions. And out of their mouth comes a fire, smoke, and sulfur by which they kill human beings in vast numbers. Let's stop here for a moment. If we go to the Old Testament, we will find that the fire, smoke, and sulfur are usually a means of executing the divine, the, 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 the divine, the divine ju uh, judgments. Is there are many biblical texts that are pointing to that? I would like you to turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, verse 22. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, chapter 38, just, just that, you, that we see how in the Old Testament language provides for us the key for the understanding of what John saw here in the vision. So, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 20, 22, okay? It says, with pestilence and with blood. I will enter into the judgment with him, and I will reign on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone, which is sabukhar. Okay. The same we can find, let's go one, another text, which is Psalm 11, Psalm 11, verse, verse 6. Psalm 11, we read verse, verse 6. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares, fire and brimstone and burning wind will be the portion of the cup. There's just a few texts which explain to us, telling us that the combination of these elements, a fire, smoke, and sulfur, points to God's judgment. May I ask you one question? Is, when we talk about this, but God's divine, the divine judgments falling on the wicked, described in the terms of these three elements, what the scene suddenly comes to your mind from the Old Testament? Yeah, you're right if you're thinking about that. It's the destruction of Sodoma and Gomorrah there. This is, this is just, just insight there in my commentary. You have a many more texts, and you can study more for yourself by telling us that here, in the scene of the sixth trumpet, we are dealing with the divine judgments. But only to describe this judgment, the inspiration uses the language of the Old Testament, or the execution of the divine judgments on the wicked in the, in the Old Testament times. There is something more that actually we learn here from this text is. John is telling us, let me go back to the, to the, to the book of Revelation is, if you go to verse 19, we read and says that the power of the horses, so chapter 9, verse, verse 19, that the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. And the rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the words of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stones and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They did not repent of their murderers, not of their sorceries, not of their immorality, not of their thefts. We well, another difficult passage of the book of Revelation is. Pay attention to one element that we have here is. It says that the power of the horses is in their mouth and in their tails. Does something come to your mind? Do you remember in the fifth trumpet, the tails are mentioned? And the power of the demonic forces in the fifth trumpet was in their tails. Let me remind you one more time what we read in Isaiah chapter 9, 14, 15, that actually provide a clue to us, telling us what the symbol of the tails is all about. Actually, Isaiah uses the expression tails with reference to false prophets. 
who are replacing the word of God for their inventions and for the lie that they try to preach to preach people. So while in the uh, fifth trumpet, the tens of the demonic forces inflict the plague on the inhabitants of the people, that, that people suffer in anguish to the point of death. We see that here in the sixth trumpet, the harm is not really with the tails, it's with the mouth. In the mouth, they are killing the inhabitants, the inhabitants of this world. Now there is a question, what does the mouth stand as a symbol of? By the way, we really do not need now to go to the Old Testament because there is one text that really parallels the scene of the sixth trumpet. It's Revelation chapter 16. And I'd like you, if you can turn with me to Revelation chapter 16, where we have the mouth as the weaponry, okay? Of those who are against God and his people in the final conflict before the second coming of Christ. It's Revelation chapter 16 from verse 13. Okay, it says, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For there are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Do you see that here? If you compare Revelation chapter 9 with chapter 16, you can see here the strong parallels. The, the two texts, they talk about the same events, which we call, according to the book of Revelation, the preparation for the, for the battle of Armageddon. Uh, I would like us to have a little bit a closer, closer look into the two texts, together with Revelation chapter 7, because I would like to make very clear statement is that the key to the understanding of the sixth trumpet finds in the connection, connecting this text with Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 17. If you put the three texts and parallel them, put them there together, you can see the common concept. You can see many pub parallels in terminology and, and expressions that are used. Not only that. Can I ask you one question is, we saw that the sixth trumpet deals with the time of the end prior to the second coming of Christ. Do I need to remind you that Revelation chapter 7 deals with the same period? When God's people, when God's people are sealed. When you go to chapter 16, the text that we just read, deals with the same time period with the preparation for the battle of Armageddon. So the three texts, they must be put together. Unfortunately, the time does not allow us to go and to analyze all these three texts in details and to draw all those numerous parallels between the three texts. But these three texts, they must be put, put together. Yes. When you compare these three texts, when you put them together, you can see how many common elements are found between, between them, which actually leads to the conclusion that the sixth trumpet really deals with the preparation for the battle of Armageddon. Yes. We have in, in, in in Revelation 9, we have four angels who are now supposed to release those demonic forces. I don't know what comes to your mind, but if you go to Revelation chapter 7, we have four angels. What are they doing there? You remember they're holding back those winds not to blow, but now what we have here is that those angels are commanded to unleash those winds. Now, we do not have here the winds. We have the demonic forces. Are you still with me? The parallels are great, but it's telling us that actually the weaponry, 
the, 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 the power and the authority of these demonic forces is in their mouth. What they're doing, telling us, friends, that the final events is not about the military and literal battle there in Middle East. It's not fortunately, many dear Christians that I know and I highly respect actually mistakenly, mistakenly understand and try to interpret here, here this text of the, of, the, of the book of Revelation. The final events, it's not a military. It's a battle for the minds of people. You see, friends, if we connect the sixth trumpet, the trumpet with the previous one, with the fifth trumpet, you remember what we saw, that, that the people rejected God. They replaced God with the atheistic teaching, with human reasoning, and people suffered those, those co consequences in the post-enlightened period. But now we have here even the deepening of that end time crisis, when people really ex will experience, and please allow me to say, people are actually experiencing the consequences of distancing themselves from God, rejecting God, and one side replacing God with atheism, and human teaching, human in, uh, 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 intentions and explanations to the other side of people who are simply taking religion, right? of emotions, replacing, by, uh, 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 taking it to replace the clear teaching of the gospel and the message of Jesus Christ that touches the hearts of people and the minds of people in order to, to communicate that message who actually we as human beings are and what God wants to happen in us. Simply replacing it with religion of emotions, nothing else. And taking from the hearts of people that clear gospel message that is based really on that loving God and his attempt to bring the human beings to them to themselves. So the sixth trumpet really brings us to the very, very time of the end. He's telling us about the preparation for the battle of Armageddon as God, by sending to the inhabitants of this world his everlasting gospel, which is in Revelation chapter 14 portrayed, we will come to that text as the three angel messages, where God is calling people to fear him and to worship him, God who created the heaven and earth, and everything that is, that is in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the universe. As God is sending his message to the people to telling them not to trust the human institutions and what human beings have done in order to replace God and to take God from the, from the hearts and minds of, of the people. At the same time, at the same time, because what people did, by rejecting God and rejecting the gospel, it gives a good occasion for the demonic forces who are coming while the fifth trumpet only tormenting people but here leading people to despair, killing people, killing and depriving them of that gospel message and that, and that eternal, eternal kingdom is. Yes, according to the pipe, according to the Bible, to the Bible, what people have decided, people reap the consequences of the decision is. But praise God, this is not the main message of the book of Revelation. Fortunately, wherever I go, I find people who read the sixth trumpet and everything they read, everything they try to find is how many people will be killed. Friends, the book of Revelation is not about killing. Yeah, it is there. Whether physical or spiritual uh, killing. That's not the point here is. But the main point is that God even wants to, ch to save those people. And that's why he's sending to, the, to them his everlasting gospel, as we will see when we reach their Revelation, Revelation chapter, chapter 14. Unfortunately, I would like that this vision has different ending than it is here. What is, what is the conclusion of this vision? Sorry, let's go back to Revelation chapter 9. He says, and the rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, 
so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stones and of wood, which can neither see nor hear not walk. They did not repent of the murderers, not of their sorceries, nor their immorality, not of their theft. If you go to Revelation chapter 21, chapter 22, you will see that all these sins that are listed here characterize those people who will not be able to enter New Jerusalem. Yes, the modern world has made so many idols and man made the religion that replaced God and actually took God and the gospel message from their hearts. The message of the sixth trumpet is a warning message to telling people that their only hope is in God. That's actually the purpose of the three angel messages of chapter 14. God is sending his message, calling people back, telling them that their only hope is in God and in the gospel. Unfortunately, the conclusion of this message, how many people will respond to that call of God? Not too many. Not too many, unfortunately. But praise God. As we will see in our next presentation is, during this time, God will have his people. Amen. Unfortunately, they will not be the majority. They'll be the minority. But God will have his people who will choose God, put God, and give him the place number one in their hearts and in their lives. And this is actually what Revelation chapters 10 and 11 is all about. Because you will notice here something, something very, very interesting. Yes. Please, can you look there in the text? So far, we, we covered the sixth trumpet. Okay, okay, are you, are you with me? The first angel sounded the trumpet. The second angel, the third angel, the fourth angel, the fifth angel, the sixth angel. What do you expect now next? But is it so? You'll now notice in chapter 10, then in chapter 11, there is no the seventh angel. We have to wait until chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 15. There is an interlude inserted between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. But in order to bring the trumpet series to its conclusion, I'd like to suggest to you that we move to the seventh trumpet. In our next two presentations, we will try to understand what we have in this interlude in chapter 10 and 11. Do you agree with me? Let's bring seven trumpets to its conclusion. So please, can you go to chapter 11 to verse, verse 15, okay? Let's see about the seven trumpet. Then the seventh angel sounded and there are loud voices in heaven saying, Okay, can you help me? What a time period historically does the sixth trumpet portray? The time prior to the second coming of Christ, the preparation for the battle of Armageddon. Can we say the time in which we exactly live today? We live today in the time of the sixth trumpet. So the seventh trumpet, it must come after that period. It brings us to the very second coming of Christ. So please keep this in mind. So the seven angels sounded and there are loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are, who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Did you notice here one element in verse 17? Let me go back, let me go back. It says, we give you thanks, are you there? We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are, 
and who were, because you have taken your great power and he began to reign. Did you notice here something very, very, very unusual? Did you notice before in the book of Revelation, how does God identify himself? The one who was, who is, and who is to come. What do we have here in this text? God who is, who was, what is lacking here? What is missing here? Why? Because he has come already. You see, the seven trumpet brings us to the very, very moment of the second coming of Christ. And you can see here, you can see here in this text, it says, verse 15, that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Let's go to verse 17. Verse 17. We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Did you notice here? Mm-hmm. Evidently, the, the seventh trumpet is probably the easiest to interpret. <laughs> Finally, I can say it with a little bit easy attempt to go and to see what all these elements are all about. So the sounding of the seven trumpets signals the conclusion of this earth history. The proclamation of the gospel is complete and the case of every person is decided. And now the voice from heaven makes declaration of the ultimate establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. This rebellious planet that has been under the dominion of Satan for many thousands of years will finally come back under God's dominion and rule. And I don't know what suddenly comes to your mind, but to my mind comes that famous text from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verse 24. You know this text, that in days of those kings, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all this kingdom, but it will itself endure forever. Yeah, finally we have the fulfillment of this prophecy from the book of Daniel chapter 2. Let us be reminded of something that we talked before. It was after his death on the cross and his subsequent ascension to heaven that Christ was recognized as the co-ruler with the Father over the universe. The Zerper, Satan, was kicked out from heaven and Christ was proclaimed to be the true ruler of the earth. Christ has become the ruler over the universe, but not yet over the planet Earth. This rebellious world is still under Satan's dominion. We saw in Revelation chapter 5 that Jesus at the day of Pentecost, he started his rule as the co-ruler with the Father there at the day of Pentecost. You remember, we talk about that. And according to Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 15, it was at that occasion, at that atonement on the day of Pentecost, that the Father has put all the enemies under his feet. However, not yet. According to the same text, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is telling us that Christ has to reign in the midst of his enemies. This rebellious planet is still rebellious, but the time is coming, according to Apostle Paul, when finally God will put into Jesus' hands all the kingdoms of this earth, earth, and when finally all the rule and all the power antagonistic to God finally will be subjected to Jesus Christ. But that day is still in the future. We are waiting for the day. And here, in the vision 
of the seventh trumpet that the long awaited day finally has come and Jesus began to reign with the great, great power and the great authority. Yeah, the seventh trumpet brings us to the very time of the second coming of Christ. But you will notice that the book of Revelation does not conclude with this section. It just concludes one section, but brings us to the last one, which is the scatological one. Bring us really to the time of the end. And I'd like you some, some, if you can go with me to verse 18. Because at this point, point, verse 18 is very, very important. Keep in mind, Revelation 7 brings us to the end, but the end is not yet. Okay? Verse 18. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. In this text that we have just read, actually we have the outline of what the last 11 chapters of the book of Revelation are all about. Chapter 11, verse 18, in a nutshell, give us the entire content of the last 11 chapters of the book of Revelation. Are you still with me? So if you really want to learn what the last 11 chapters of the book of Revelation are all about, just read verse 18 of chapter, of chapter. Let, let me put it this way. What is the first prayer? It says, the nations were enraged. Okay. Why are the nations enraged? We will see very, very soon that in chapter 12, verse 17, Satan becomes enraged. Then he associates himself with the two bees that represent political powers, gathering all the um, nations of the earth from themselves who become enraged Why? against God and his people. So really, these nations were enraged. The background of this text in, is in Psalm 2. Actually, it's elaborated in chapter 13, then going also chapters 14, 15, and, and 16, telling us about the nations that are enraged in that anger and the rage that are preparing themselves for the battle of Armageddon. Then it says, your wrath came. Where do we have that the wrath of God has come? If you go to Revelation chapter 15, verse one, so chapters 15 and 16, we read, then I saw another sign in heaven, chapter 15, verse one, Great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Here he says, your wrath has come. You see, the seven last plagues are the expression of the wrath of God upon the rebellious humanity, who have sided with Satan, have received the image of the beast, and they are eager to destroy God's people. You see that? We have now the content of chapters 15, 16. And now it says that the time for the dead to be judged. Where do we have the judgment over dead? Of course, Revelation chapter 20, after the millennium. But keep in mind that the judgment has two aspects. It has the positive and has a negative. In chapter 19, God's faithful people are vindicated. Amen. They are judged rightly before God. And now they are in the kingdom of God. They are portrayed as the bride waiting for the bridegroom to come. It's the wedding supper, supper of the Lamb. But then we have the negative aspect of that judgment. And which is the negative aspect? Is to destroy the, the destroyers of the earth. Please allow me, we have a few minutes left. And I, will, I would like just to take this remaining portion of time, these few minutes that are left, 
just to deal a little bit with this phrase, to destroy the destroyers of the earth. And I just want to show to you how it's so easy that we take one phrase from the book of Revelation or one text of the book of Revelation and read all kind of different ideas that we, that we have there. For many people, Revelation 11, 19, the destroyers, to destroy the destroyers of the earth, that these texts refer to the ecological concerns, this, uh, the earth being destroyed by modern technology. You probably heard about that, that interpretation. And, and I just want to tell you, friends, the book of Revelation is not about modern technology. The book of Revelation is not about ecology and um, our modern concerns today that we have. Of course, we as Christians, we have to care about environment. We have, but the book of Revelation is not about ecology. It's about the plan of salvation. It's about the conclusion of this, of this great controversy between God, God and, and, and Satan. And finally, the establish, establishment of God's eternal kingdom. Amen. So what is the meaning of the phrase to destroy the destroyers of the earth? Please, unfortunately, I'd like to do something, but I'm not able to do it here. I simply would like to refer to you, and the text will appear there on the screen, uh, at least the reference there. I want to show to you how it's important to allow the Bible interpret itself. The first the background to the phrase, to destroy those who destroy the earth, it's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 12 and 14. If you have in front of yourself the English translation of the Bible, any English translation version, uh, it will not be of great help to you. But let me put it how it looked both in Hebrew Bible, the Bible, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and how it looks into the Hebrew translation of, of the Hebrew Bible into the Septuagint in Greek. Both are the same, is, and it looks like this way. Please, let me now paraphrase it. It says, God saw from heaven how every flesh on earth was destroying the earth. In our English translation, it says they were corrupting the earth. Actually, it's the same Hebrew and also Greek word is used. They say God saw how the antediluvians were destroying the earth. And God says, because they are destroying the earth, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Amen. How are those people destroying the earth? With immorality, with corruption, distorting that image of God there, etc. But there is another text also in the Bible that somehow sheds a light to the meaning of that. It's Jeremiah 51, 25. So Jeremiah 51, 25. There, the prophet identifies the historical Babylon, historical Babylon, the arch enemy of God's people in the Old Testament, as destroying mountain, now again in Hebrew and in Greek, okay, who destroys the whole earth. And God says, I'm coming against you, you destroying mountain. And I will destroy you from the earth. Amen. So tell me, when we have here is that in that final judgment, just before God establishes his kingdom, God will destroy, destroy us of the earth. Who are those who are destroying the earth? See, this is not simply about ecology, of course. Ecology comes as a result of everything what people are doing on the face of the earth. Actually, it's about the end time Babylon. The Babylon is destroying the earth by those corrupting influences, by rejecting the gospel, turning the hearts and the minds people away from God. And God is now coming to destroy Babylon because the Babylon was destroying the earth. You see how it's important that we take the Bible and to allow the Bible to interpret itself. Now, in the conclusion, let's go 
that you see how actually the book of Revelation explained to us what this destroying of the earth is all about. It's Revelation 19.2. Revelation 19.2. Revelation 19.19.2. Are you there? It's the conclusion of the battle of Armageddon. You remember we just mentioned it's about those judgments of God. Positive judgments on his people and negative judgments on the enemies of God's people. So Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2. And after these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Please pay attention now. Because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was destroying the earth with her immorality, and he was avenged the blood of his servants on her. Who was the entity that was destroying actually the earth? You see, that is the great prostitute Babylon that we will meet and discuss about and to deal with when we come to Revelation chapter 17. It's a Babylon. It's Babylon. It's the entity in the book of Revelation that destroys the earth. If you go to Revelation chapter 18, verse 5, we have the destruction of the earth by Babylon. It says, For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. It's about the Babylon. It's a Babylon that destroys the earth. Yes, it is with the seventh trumpet. Finally, the prayers of God's people there at the altar, underneath the altar, calling upon God and asking for the vengeance and vindication finally will be, will be answered. This is all what we can say about the seventh trumpet. Yes, we, we have a wonderful God. People are reaping the consequences of the decision, but God still wants to save human beings. He saved me, and dear viewers, he wants also to save each one of us. May God be with you. Amen.